Hi, I'm Lee. I'm a New Zealander living in the East Riding of Yorkshire in the United Kingdom and this is my podcast about my handmade life. You can find me on Ravelry as Luli and on Instagram as Instamatic Luli and I'm also a purveyor of fine knitting bags and you can find my shop on Etsy as Shop Luli. Welcome, it's really nice to have you here again and to be back. It has been 31 days since my last podcast and this month just seems to have galloped by. There's so many nice things that have been happening and just general stuff. So it feels like an age since I've been talking to you and it's really nice to be back and saying hello and sharing some time with you. So it's lovely to have you here. Now I think last time on the podcast I introduced my first cow which is the Knit 1000 Grams cow and quite a few of you have joined in with me which is really exciting. Um, to have you all along on that trip and what's been really interesting is that a number of you posted um, photographs of the kilo of yarn that you'd actually not like to knit and there seemed to be sort of like common colour palettes um, that people were tending towards which was really interesting and I was looking at people's yarns and they had really lovely things in their stash. I mean, I feel like I have lovely things in my stash as well. So I hope getting it all out and putting it all together and deciding what you were going to knit made you feel really excited about the stuff that you actually already have. I mean, I know it's really, it's really fun to be excited about new things as well, but I think sometimes we forget how lovely our stash is to begin with. But anyway, a load of you have joined in with me and there's been lots of photos on Instagram. Some people have already knitted up their kilo of yarn, uh, which is terribly impressive because I'm nowhere near that. Um, and there's been a lot of you chatting amongst yourselves over on the Ravelry board as well. If you're not a member of the Luli Ravelry group, it would be lovely to have you along. Whether you want to join in with the cowl or not, just come and say hello. That would be brilliant. But yes, it's been wonderful to see your finished objects and to hear you chatting about your plans and what you'd like to knit and what your deadlines are and all that sort of thing. Just brilliant. And last time I said there would be prizes. And so I have sorted out the dates for that for the giveaways as we go along. Um, as I said, my deadline for this is the Edinburgh Yarn Festival. And at the rate I'm going... <sighs> <laughs> Apparently I like to knit with fine yarn. So, hmm. Anyway, so the deadline is the Edinburgh Yarn Festival. So the final prize draw will be on the 10th of March. And then I'm going to have two other motivational prize draws that are not going to involve yarn. <laughs> the first one will be on the 26th of December, Boxing Day because I figure if you're using this as a way of sort of not buying yarn until you've actually finished your kilo then Christmas could be tough so I decided it was only sensible to do a giveaway for the 26th of December I've picked dates that are easy for me to remember <laughs> so and the first prize is going to be a copy of the latest Pom Pom magazine and there's some lovely things in here this is a pristine version, so unadulterated by my reading or anything. This is all special for you. They come beautifully wrapped up. I shall re-wrap it, but probably not in the original papers because I've made a mess of those. I'll do my best to wrap it nicely. And I'll pop in some other bits and pieces as well to make this a nice prize package. But that will be a nice thing. It might get to you in time to read over the new year while you have some time off. So that prize draw will be on the 26th of December and I shall announce it in the Ravelry thread because sometimes I forget to come back and announce things here but I always announce them in the thread so you can see who did win. Um, so the next prize draw will be on the 6th of February and I haven't decided what that prize will be yet but it will be non-yarn related. It will not be yarn. 
Um, and if you'd like to donate a prize, then please get in touch with me and let me know. I think the final prize draw on the 10th of March, which I'm planning to do on the train on the way to the Edinburgh Yarn Festival, might be yarn. That might be something special from the festival. I don't know, I'll have a think about that one, I'll have a ponder. Something that you can't really get anywhere else. Hmm. Anyway, plenty of time to think about that. But the first prize draw will be on the 26th of December and it will be from the progress thread. You don't need to have finished, you just need to be progressing. You don't have to be finished for any of the deadlines, it's just sort of like if you have, if you want to knit your kilo over a longer period, then that's fine. Um, yeah, prizes are for, for joining in. So there you go, but it's been lovely to have you all along on that trip even though I haven't finished anything at all yet. Hmm. So let's talk about the knitting. Um, the first thing I had been working on, and I had thought that this thing would eat up a bit of yarn, and it hasn't. I have been working on my cardigan. You've seen this before, there's really nothing new to say about it, except that I have finished the torso. I haven't bound it off. Ooh. Come backwards. I haven't bound it off because I'm going to, once I've done the sleeves, I'm just going to make sure that the length looks about right. Um, I've knitted this almost exactly as per the pattern, except I added in an extra repeat um, when it came to increasing around the hips, partly because I need a little bit of extra distance around my hips and partly because I could do with a little bit of extra length. But oddly, the waist for this actually fell. I usually have to add the extra length in here so that the waist is lowered a bit, but I didn't have to for this. It seemed to be in about the right place. Um, so what I'll do is I'm going to knit the sleeves and then wash it and try it on and decide if I need any extra length. And so far, I am on my fifth ball of yarn, so I've only actually knitted about 200 grams on that. Because as you can see, most of it is holes. I've been knitting fresh air, which is incredibly frustrating when it comes to progressing towards my kilo. Um, and knitting all those holes had become rather arduous, so I have been taking a break from that. Um, and just putting it aside for a while. So now that is the Neon Cardi by Hohe Locatelli and I am using some, where's the label gone? Oh, some new Lanark yarn, double knitting, pure new wool and silk. I think it's their Donegal Tweed. In the cobalt colour, doesn't actually say if it's the Donegal Tweed. I think I did this last time where I was looking for it on the label and it wasn't written. But anyway, 90% pure new wool, 10% silk. So yes, I don't think I'm going to, I'm definitely not going to use up all the yarn that I've got because as I say, most of this cardi seems to be fresh air. So it's going along really well. It's going to fit really nicely, I think. I'm just a bit disgruntled that I, I, I'm not eating my way through more of my stash. <laughs> So anyway, I got to the sleeves of that one and decided to pick up my sock project. So, let me get a sock blocker here. Put this on for display purposes. This is another thing with lots of holes in where I'm mostly knitting fresh air. This is just, well it was a vanilla sock until I decided to put some random stitch pattern in it. And the yarn is a BFL Blueface Sister nylon that I dyed myself. I think I called it Fishbowl because it's got those little orange flecks in it. Um, and then I decided to put this little lace pattern in. So more holes. Um, I went down a needle size on this to a 2.25 millimetre needle 
without thinking that I might need to increase my stitch count. So they don't actually fit me. <laughs> so I finished them a bit early and just made them a size smaller and I'm going to gift them to a friend of mine. I think they're about a size four. So yes, she's very knit worthy but she doesn't watch the podcast. For some reason my normal slip stitch heel construction went awry and so I just did a plain stocking stitch heel construction with the garter stitch down the side. Um, lots of people say that it's easier to pick up your stitches when you do the garter stitch but I don't know, I don't think it makes that much difference. I think the main thing that makes it easier to pick up the stitches is just slipping the first one of, the, of every row. Um, but it does look really neat down there, so yeah. And I have cast on the second one of those and got just a little way along. But that was more holes as well and as they're not for me, Maybe that sounds a bit selfish. They're not for me, so I can't be bothered to finish them. No, but as I say, it was more eyelets, and I feel like I've done overkill on eyelets at the minute. It was probably after doing that shawl as well. There's way too many holes in my life, in my knitting life anyway. So yes, I have popped that to one side for now. Because... Well, it's on four ply yarn, so it doesn't really feel like it's going to, to eat a lot of yarn all at once. You can see how I'm totally weight focused now. So there I was feeling rather disgruntled that I wasn't chewing my way through more of my stash and I was already over a month into this thing um, and hadn't even reached the halfway mark. So I went rifling round for one of the more heavyweight yarns in my stash, <laughs> a new project to cast on. I've been starting all the things. Um, and so I found some, this lovely Madeline Tosh vintage and I bought this to make a Christmas present. I bought this last year to make a Christmas present for my allotmentering. Chum. I have two skeins of it and I thought I would love, like to make her a lovely wintry set that she can swan around on the allotment. Uh, I think I said that that was Madeline Tosh Vintage and I am going to make, what's it called, the Structured Alpaca Cowl by Pearl Soho. I've made one of these before, they're really um, contoured around your neck, they sit nicely inside a coat and they're good for outdoors. And so this is as far as I've got. It's a pretty big, what do you think, moustache? Not beard yet, but anyway. Was that Kat Candace from Pin Feathers and Fur Pearls who started that? Anyway, um, so that's as far as I've got so far. I got distracted by something else. Um, I chose this yarn because my allotment tearing chum is definitely knit worthy but I wanted to give her something that would be easy for her to care for that she can put in the washing machine um, so she didn't have to feel like she had to be too precious with it. Um, she's a very outdoorsy sort of person, she likes cycling and gardening and that sort of thing and outdoorsy in all weathers. And so I thought this would be a nice yarn that won't be itchy because I believe it's merino. I should check the label before I go saying that, shouldn't I? Yeah, superwash merino. So I chose this because it will not have the prickle factor, I don't think. It doesn't feel prickly to me. Um, and be easy for her to care for. And I think it's a colour that will look really good on her. Yeah, so I've got two skeins of this and I'm going to make a cowl with one skein and then I can't decide if I shall make mitts, mittens or a hat with the other skein. I think I'm finding it really difficult to choose a hat style for her. Um, she has quite a round face and I'm just not sure what, what would flatter her most. So if you have any ideas about... Um, 
what would look good, what hat pattern would look good on someone with a round face. If you've got that sort of face shape and you've got a hat that looks really good on you, I would love to hear about it in the episode thread. I also have another DK weight skein of yarn that would kind of coordinate with that. So I could either do it in the Madeleine and Tosh vintage that I have, or I could use that other skein of yarn, which is kind of a light denim color. So if you have any suggestions, please pop over to the Ravelry thread for this episode and let me know, that would be brilliant. That would save me a problem. Well, not really, not that big a problem. It's not world altering or anything, but it would just be nice to have some suggestions. So I was knitting away on that. And then last Sunday I got up and I was looking for a nice pair of woolly handmade socks and I looked in my sock drawer and there weren't any. So I decided to cast on a new pair of socks uh, I also put a load of washing on, which is, was probably more the problem. But anyway, you'll be able to hear the little bell I have attached to my project bag. Oh. So, look, I haven't put this on a sock blocker either. This is just a vanilla sock. And... I have tucked the yarn end through the stitches because I can't find my little clippy and stitch markers at the moment so they're just telling me how many rows, I, I don't know if you can see that tucked through a stitch every now and again, I've done it every 20 stitches. But anyway, I'm sure the clippy stitch markers are probably just in some other random project bag and they will reappear at some point. The yarn for this was a really lovely one, I love the colour, now let me find the tag. This is from The Fawn and the Fox and it is Lara's Badger Base which is bum -ba -dum, Blue Face Lester and Nylon um, and I'm really liking the Blue Face Lester socks that I dyed for myself so I thought this would be really nice to cast on. Lara sent this to me quite unexpectedly in a swap and I love the colour. This is her terrarium colour. And I wound this up into a cake pretty much straight away. And I had been saving it for a specific special sock pattern. Um, but I had been putting off doing it because it looked a bit tricky. It required a funny cast on and then it had a lacy pattern. And so when I discovered that my sock drawer was empty, I just... I've, I've been wanting to cast this on for ages so I just decided to do a vanilla sock so that I could be wearing it. I want to wear this yarn on my feet. I think it's going to be lovely and I really like the green colour with these little red flecks and yellowy sort of bits in it. Actually there's turquoise in there as well. It's just beautiful. So I'm very excited to be knitting that up and I have made some progress on the second sock which you can see here. I'm doing the same thing, I'm hooking my hooking my end in so I can see how many rows I've done there. Yeah, so I think I've got about 20 more rows to go before I get, get to the second heel turn. Uh, and I've just put that blue in, I consulted Instagram about whether the heels should be blue or orange. And you guys were pretty much split down the middle about that, so I decided to make them blue. I think that looks rather nice. Yeah, I decided that cuffs, heels and toes would be overkill on that one. I really do just like putting a, putting a nice different coloured heel and it looks really good. And the yarn I've used is quite squishy. I wonder what that is. I've probably got the label somewhere. I should look it up. So yes, I'm hoping to finish those before the end of the week. I'm really looking forward to wearing them. Of course, I've washed all my socks now, so my sock drawer is full again. But you know, sometimes you just need a few extras. This is the sewing section. And if you follow me on Instagram, you will have seen that I have a new sewing machine, which is so exciting. 
I have been saving up for a sewing machine for quite some time and then the hairy man got it for me for my birthday which was just lovely. I, he has been offshore and I got this message saying that my sewing machine was going to turn up which is very exciting. There wasn't really anything wrong with my old sewing machine. It is very old and it does take a lot of wear and tear which I think is starting to show a bit now even though I have it serviced regularly. But yeah, so I have been doing a lot of sewing this week. Testing it out, trying new things. Um, I've made a batch of bags on it and basically just pushing all the buttons and doing all the fun things. And so I have also started a couple of sewing projects. The first one, because I've been sewing obsessed this week, I have been watching lots of quilt tutorials on YouTube. And I had laying about the house um, a jelly roll, which is basically just a roll, um, a set of coordinating strips of fabric that you use for patchwork and I haven't done a lot of patchwork before or quilting and so I, I bought this jelly roll and I had made a bag with it which I really liked but it didn't even use half the, the jelly roll so I've had it laying around thinking that I should have another go at piecing and quilting um, but not really, I thought I had found a pattern that I liked and then I was watching these tutorials on YouTube and there was one particular tutorial for a jelly roll by the Missouri Quilt Company, I shall link to it in the show notes and it looked relatively simple but the pattern was really fun. And I haven't got a huge way, I haven't even um, pressed these yet. I have been making my strip sets. See, I've got all the lingo now that I've been watching all these videos. So I have been making my strip sets with my leftover jelly roll. I think this one, it's a Moda jelly roll called um, Real Time. And I used a lot of the greys and blacks when I made my bag which was dead fun. It was another Missouri Quilt Company in association with Crafty Gemini. Um, I think I originally became aware of it because of Minerva Turkey, um, but it was a really fun bag tutorial. And this quilt just looks lots of fun. So I haven't even pressed my strip sets yet. I have just sewed them together. I decided to do this at about eight o'clock at night last week. So yeah. So I need to press them and cut them into squares and then do some, well I say I, I was thinking fancy things but it's not that fancy. It looks quite simple but of course I've not done it yet so it may not be simple. So I'm quite looking forward to, to cracking on with that but as I say I've done a lot of sewing this week. I think my eyes and my head are starting to go a bit, I'm going sewing blind. Um, so I started that off. And at some point I shall press those and cut them all out ready for ready for the next step. That would be exciting. I've only ever made one quilt before and that was, I made it out of um, old shirts from my previous work colleagues. They collected them up and gave them to me because I liked the idea that patchwork was about uh, using up bits and pieces of scraps and giving new life to fabrics that might have seen better days so yeah but that was my that was that's the only quilt that I've done so this is really my second go at it um, and I'm really excited to be working on that and give that some more more work this week lots of fun <coughs> But the other thing I decided to do, because I had a new sewing machine and I thought it would be a good way of testing it out. Oh, I've got a frog. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I thought it would be a good way of testing it out and also to use some techniques that I hadn't done before but I didn't think would be incredibly challenging 
was I decided to go to sewing school, um, which I normally go to weekly, and do a knickers workshop. Um, I haven't been going to sewing school recently because I didn't really have a sewing project in mind that I really badly wanted to do so I thought I would take a break for a while have a little hiatus and then come back to it but then uh, Michelle from Everston Studios said that they were having this knickers workshop and did I want to join in and so yesterday I went off and made myself some undies as you can see and as I said I have I thought it was a good way of trying out some new things on my new sewing machine but I've been sewing a lot this week and I think I had I was just having a brain fail and um, I don't know how it happened but on the back you can see there's a little seam here can you see that and that is because somehow I managed to lop off the edge of that piece for my undies so I basically had to patch them back together. Um, the pattern was one that um, I think Michelle had drafted herself and we just had to bring along um, our own fabric so this was a lawn cotton that I had in stash and yeah she supplied the, the jersey for the gusset I haven't done the neatest job there. The jersey for the gusset and the elastic. And the elastic, she had a lovely selection of elastics that went quite well with my fabric. Um, and we measured ourselves and worked out what size, the sizes were quite generous actually. Um, yeah, some bits I found like even just sewing the jersey, getting the right setting and tension, even just for that little seam across the front of the gusset, um, took me a few goes to get that right. And sewing on the elastic, it wasn't, it wasn't really challenging, but it did take a little bit of concentration. Um, I did, I did alter the pattern that. Um, that she gave us. I put a little bit, I made the, the waist a little bit higher and I'm glad I did because it's still very much a hipster, a hipster knicker. And I also put, the front seemed very narrow. So I didn't add any widths to the gusset but I did just add it down the sides here. I haven't worn these yet. I'm gonna try them out and see how they feel. They're it's a woven fabric but they're cut on the bias so actually there's quite a lot of, of give in there so I'm just really interested to see how they feel um, will they be comfortable and stay in place and all that sort of thing and it was just a really good fun day everybody had really nice fabrics um, yeah so if these are comfy I might have a go at making another pair of underpants that was lots of, it was so much fun and it was such a good day out as well. Um, and I've not, I've not sewed a lot of jersey. So even though that bit wasn't particularly big, it was quite nice just to have it play around with the settings on my machine to make sure I still got a nice, neat seam there. And I've never sewn elastic straight into something. So that was really interesting as well. I think sometimes it's nice to do a small project that you don't have much invested in just to try out something that you wouldn't normally do. Yeah, good fun. So the last thing I have to talk to you about is a question from oh, Laman Chimama. I think that's how you say it. If I've got that wrong, I'm really sorry. And she wanted to know how I started spinning and does my family raise sheep and have I spun home growing wool? Um, I think I'll start backwards. I grew up on a hill country farm in New Zealand. Um, it was 400 acres and we had about a thousand Romney ewes, which in England sounds like a lot. And 
in New Zealand that was that was considered quite a small farm and uh, we made ends meet but there wasn't always a lot left over so here 4,000 acres with a thousand sheep sound huge but in New Zealand that is relatively small um, and when I was growing up it was it was normal for women to be able to spin and it was normal to see a spinning wheel in the living room in people's homes um, my mum spun and her best friends spun as well and were quite creative people uh, they all had Ashford traditionals or Ashford travellers um, being in New Zealand and yeah mum would use the it was usually the fleeces that weren't white because of course you couldn't just put those in with the rest of the fleeces because they would sully all the white so any sort of black or grey fleeces went over to for hand spinning um, and it was just such a normal thing to do a normal part of everyday life and I never did it <laughs> when I was when I was younger I guess there was enough yarn and fibre floating about that it wasn't really something that I was drawn to at the time it was just such a normal part of life and handling fleece was such a normal part as, of life as well raw fleece or prepared fleece it was you know you could always get your hands on some um, and we would go down to the wool shed when they were shearing and the fleeces would be there it wasn't un unusual to stand in a partly packed wool bale up to your waist in fleeces <laughs> yeah handling fleece and fiber was just a, a regular part of everyday life um, I can remember we made felt slippers out of out of fleece from the farm but as I say I never actually spun it and my parents uh, sold the farm and have been retired for quite some time now and so they have a small holding now where they graze Perindale rams for a friend um, but they aren't shorn on the property or anything like that so I haven't actually spun anything from my parents property and I guess that opportunity has kind of gone by the by now that they aren't living on the farm anymore I can remember mum teaching my brother to spin but not me I think I just became a knitter and that was it and as I say there was so much so much yarn floating about the place I guess I didn't feel like I was inclined to make more and my spinning journey began maybe about 10 or 12 years ago and I was starting to think that I would like to, to have a go at spinning but it was at a time I was working full time I was quite busy I was doing a lot of extra time as well and I just it was just another hobby <laughs> it was something that I really wanted to do but not necessarily something I felt like I had time for but one of my friends when I lived in London had heard about a spinning course um, it was up near Black Horse Road I forget the name of the shop and we decided to go along for the day and we spent the morning using spindles and that was the first time ever I had even seen a spindle it had not been on spindle spinning had not been on my radar at all um, so when we had finished talking about fleeces and how they looked and which was the back end and the front end and where the best wool was which was already information that was quite familiar to me and then the tutor brought out these spindles I was kind of like ah oh, what's this thing and I could do it but I just found it really frustrating I didn't really get the point in it you know I wanted to learn to spin on a wheel that was just what my expectation was and so in the afternoon when we got the wheels out 
that just seemed much more normal to me and I suppose like I can remember as a child um, I might not have been spinning but I had definitely played with mum's wheel and made it gone backwards and forwards and made it gone super fast and super slow and you know and sat there and treadled a lot um, and just played with it when it wasn't in use and pretended to spin um, and so that bit actually getting it going and treadling came quite naturally and I suppose the other thing was that I was used to handling fleece as well, greasy fleece and clean fleece. And so drawing it out and having it came, come apart just seemed really normal. I found it, I don't want to sound conceited, but I found it relatively easy. I don't, things that, things that require hand or eye coordination or any sort of coordination are usually quite hard for me to pick up. And so the fact that I was managing to tread all this thing and have it go in the right direction and to draw out and get a relatively decent yarn just, just seemed to come naturally. Um, it probably helped that there was someone there to make sure that the wheel and the tension were set up correctly. And so I had quite a happy afternoon spinning. And they sent me home with this drop spindle, which I just didn't get <laughs> I didn't want to get um, and so I just put spinning aside after that and as I say I felt like if I started spinning at that point then my projects were just going to drag on forever I needed something at the time that was perhaps a little bit more instant gratification um, and spinning was just going to take up room in my small London flat and take up a lot of time so I didn't start spinning again until I moved in with the hairy man and he bought me a lovely um, Magecraft little gem spinning wheel which is very compact, it's their travel version but it's also a very versatile wheel um, and it, it takes up no room at all in the house. I thought I was going to have to fold it down and slide it under the couch, but really it takes up about this much floor space. It really is a very compact wheel that I can just pop in the corner and pull out whenever I want to use it. And so I, I've had that for about four years now. Um, it took me a little bit longer to get the hang of tensioning it um, but I just really enjoy spinning it's very relaxing and very meditative and when I first got the wheel I made sure that I did about 10 or 15 minutes every day on my spinning wheel so that I would get the hang of it and of course I, I should have bought my first yarn it's very thick and thin and yeah not not the best yarn in the world. Um, I didn't knit with the first batch of yarn that I made but I did start plying it and knitting with maybe the, the, the second lot. I started knitting with it quite early because I thought that was the best way to to learn about yarn structure and what I liked about yarn structure and I still think that's a good thing to do. If you're going to spin then you should definitely make at least a swatch with it so that you can see how good your yarn is for the purpose that you want to make it for whether that's weaving or crochet or something like that to see if there's anything you want to change in your spinning um, so by that time as well I had become more familiar with spindle spinning and different types of spindles I think the other thing was I should go, go back a step I downloaded some videos by Judith McKenzie from the Interweave website and they are absolutely jam-packed full of information. I think the first one was the spinner's toolbox and then there was another one that I downloaded about plying. She talks a mile a minute and it's all just information and so I've probably watched those about six times now and still pick up new new tidbits when I go back to them. I think I prefer spinning videos over spinning books um, just because you can see what's happening in motion which for spinning is kind of 
is really useful because it is it is a motion it's a movement thing that you're doing and so to be able to see 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 someone do it in action is really helpful um i also um got the craftsy class by amy king for beginner spinners and I found that actually really basic. There was a lot of information in there that I had already picked up in other places. But I think if you're brand new to spinning, she has a really nice approach to get you used to your wheel and then to get you used to drafting because they are two very different activities that you have to do together when you're using a spinning wheel. So anyway, that was my spinning wheel introduction. And of course, spindles were much more on my radar at that point. Um, and I started spindle spinning when I saw someone was on, on a blog or something with a Turkish spindle and that was just so intriguing to me the fact that you could make this little ball of yarn and I discovered that there were some people really close to me with about 10 miles away that actually made Turkish spindles and I, it was Kerry's spindles they live over in Antin and they make lovely spindles and it came super quickly to my house um, and I just sat it beside the toaster and every morning while my bread was toasting I would do a little bit of spinning maybe just a meter or two but a little bit at a time and really started to enjoy that as well so that was the beginning of my spindling journey in fact, that's the beginning of my entire spinning journey. I'm not sure there's much more to add to that. So I hope that answers your question. It was like, how did I start spinning and does your family raise sheep? Well, yes, they did. I've talked about that. Yeah, so I think that's, uh, that answers your question. If you do have anything that you'd like to hear about, it's always really nice um, if you pop a question over in the what would you like to hear about thread. Um, it gives me an idea of what you want to hear me witter on about. <laughs> but anyway, it's been lovely to have you here today and to sit down and have a chat with you and share what I've been doing. And I always enjoy the conversation after I've podcasted about what things you've been doing um, and similar interests that you've got. So it's nice if you pop over to the Ravelry thread and say hello if you want to join in the 1000 grams cow then that would be fantastic um, otherwise it'd just be nice to hear from you in the episode thread um, and that's all from me today thank you for coming along and I shall see you next time cheerio